You're listening to a message from New Beginnings Lakeside Church. Today's speaker is Pastor Doug Horner. Beautiful day today as we uh, come into March, and uh, I'm sure we may see a little bit more, uh, hopefully no more windy weather like we had uh, this past week. Um, but a uh, couple things. Uh, one, I want to remind you again at... Uh, Two o'clock today, if you would like to pray, uh, we're as a church family and a community uh, rallying around the Wilt family just to pray, uh, just it's simple, simply just to pray. Uh, there'll be some uh, cards in the foyer. You can write out prayers if you would like. They're going to create a, a scrapbook for them, so um, um, all the Wilt family. So if you, if you want to come out and be a part of that or just at two o'clock, wherever you are, uh, to take some time to lift them up. Uh, in prayer, and then uh, um, I, I was, I was um, the the announcement that the rights made sectional or one sectionals. That's right. So I got to make sure I got it right. So yeah. So I was at a wedding in Boonville doing a wedding for uh, Rhett and Emily um, Snodgrass last night. So beautiful uh, evening with them. Uh, but so many good things going on, and uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. We're moving on. In uh, Matthew, and Matthew, as we as you're turning there to ch- chapter 18, verse one, uh, Matthew records five uh, major discords uh, or discourses. Uh, these are teachings uh, from Jesus. We've we've looked at three of them so far: the Sermon on the Mount in chapters five to seven. We we looked at the commissioning of the apostles and their mission in chapter ten. If you remember, in nine, at the end of nine, he says. Pray for the Lord of harvest, that, that the, the harvest is plentiful. There is a harvest out there. I want to constantly remind us as his church, the harvest is out there. And it's like uh, we, saw, we saw the movie um, Jesus Revolution uh, last week. Uh, I got, we got to go with a lot of people in the church. And um, just a beautiful picture of God's move. And, <clears throat> and you see God moving in, in our young people, in young people in general, Right now, they're searching for truth. Uh, you know, the, the drugs and, and stuff that they were talking about in, in the 60s and 70s that they were trying to find enlightenment in today, I think, is more in the social media. And obviously, those things still exist. But, but I, I do see a movement, uh, uh, the harvest that is out there. And it's just the faithfulness of his church. God draws people to himself. We don't have to, we don't make anybody. Come to Christ, and I mean, I had the privilege of, of asking someone this week, uh, very very pointedly, asked them if they wanted to receive Christ as the Lord and Savior, and they told me no. They told me no, and I, and I just told them that you know that I I want to if you know you don't have I don't have to be here for you to, to receive Christ, and I said this is how you would do it. <laughs> this is how you would receive Christ if you want to do it. I told him taught him how to pray. To receive Christ. So, you, you know, sometimes people say no, but people say yes because uh, they're open to the Lord. So, that was the commissioning of the apostles in Matthew chapter, the end of nine and all of chapter 10 in their mission they sent them out on. And then there's the parables of the kingdom we talked about, we studied on in chapter 13. Uh, and then at the end of Matthew in chapters 24 and 25, we have the discourse on his second coming. That's the eschatology of Christ, that's the, sec- that's the coming of Christ. Um, and this morning, uh, we are opening chapter 18. This is the, the discourse on the childlikeness of the believer. Uh, we'll be looking throughout this whole chapter, not all today. Uh, we will f- uh, conclude it over either next week or the week after. It just depends. There's so much. I could, I could preach eight sermons uh, on what we're studying today in the first 14 verses, and I promise you, I'm only going to do four of them for you, okay? We're only going to do four, so I hope you're like buckled down, ready to go. But there's some really amazing things in this chapter, and one of the things that uh, Pastor David will probably be the one uh, covering is, is how do we deal with conflict, and how do we deal with uh, a break in a relationship, and how you know, how do we go and re- restore relationships? We're going to be looking at that, and I think that's a big one in each of our lives because we all deal with people every day and people that we love dearly, and sometimes um, we can get sideways with those people because of, of just life. And so 
Jesus gives us instructions on how uh, to reconcile with people and to forgive people, and that's part of this, of this chapter, uh, and then also the life of a disciple. So we're going to be looking at that, but t- today, uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at the childlikeness of a believer, the child of God, uh, and that's the title of the message. So if we open up um, the whole chapter... Is triggered by verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. It says, At that time, uh, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest? And when we're talking about the realities that they're facing, uh, they're looking at Christ as the, as the Messiah. Remember, Peter had said, you know, when he, they said, who do, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, Hey, you know, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. Uh, they were thinking in terms of earthly uh, at that time. It, it was uh, much deeper, uh, obviously, than that. We know that on this side, uh, how, how great it would be to be able to, to know all things uh, in life. But they, they just understood. They were coming to understand. And this chapter is a way of Christ beginning to help them deal um, more deeply in their understanding and so they're asking, who is the greatest? This was a question that was ongoing. If you look at the parallel account in Mark chapter 9, 33, should be on the board. Uh, it says, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, and he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Uh, they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest they didn't want to look at Jesus and tell him that. That was, their, that was what they were talking about. That's uh, the reality. Uh, but that's the, the human side of us. If we're going to be in a kingdom and our, the guy that we're following is the king, uh, we want to make sure we're in the room, the right room. And the best place to be is to the side of this king. And so they were constantly asking. I think the question had really fired up further because you know, at the time that we're just coming out of uh, Jesus' rebuke of Peter uh, over the fact that Peter said, you know, I'll never let you go to the cross. I'll never let you uh, die at the hands of, of these men. And remember, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, that was like, whoa, he just told Peter. because Peter, Peter was the guy. Peter was the guy and one of the guys, James and John. They had just come, in at, come off of the mountain of transfiguration. We just studied that. And uh, they, uh, you know, Peter got to share in the fishing story from last Sunday. If you remember, he went and found the fish that had the drachma uh, to pay the tax. And, and so and in their minds, they probably thought, eh, Peter's the one. But wait, no, he got rebuked. This is our chance. This is our chance. So they argue with one another about that So as to who is the greatest. And that's, the, that's what the, great, the Greek word in Luke 9, 46 of this account, it says an argument arose among them as to who was the greatest. That was who, who of us is the greatest. That's what they want to know. And I think that's a reality check for each of us because the Lord has to deal with all of us in our fleshly desires, our want for greater things. And sometimes the greater things we want aren't what God wants and tends for us. He has greater things. In relationships, when we deal in relationships or broken relationships, we got to understand at times that, that God is at work in that relationship issue. If someone walks away because he's got, he's got, you know, maybe for the young, young person, who's looking for, you know, a marriage relationship, if that person walks out, well, that kind of makes a relationship hard. You know, if, if the person's not in the room with you, you, both, you know, in a marriage relationship, if you're going to get married, you want both people to be on board, and no one should be forced in that relationship. I got to do, like I said, Rhett and Emily's wedding. I'm probably on a, uh, on a run of about eight weddings here in this year, and it's beautiful. It's exciting. Uh, to see all these kids and uh, to see what God's doing in their life. But they're, they're all committed to one another. That you, that's the, how you come into a marriage. And it's through, as I go through uh, like five premarital counseling sessions with each couple, I 
I always emphasize I, like it's, it's through Christ, that Christ gives us the kind of love that we have to have for one another. So I say that to say if someone is, if you're in a relationship and it, it falls apart, which it happened in my life, it's happened in many of your people's lives. And really, I wouldn't have Jennifer today if those relationships hadn't fallen apart. And, and I wouldn't want to miss Jennifer for anything. We always look to like what we want, but God says, I have something greater for you. And we look to the world for fulfillment, but in reality, what, where you are now in your marriage is what God wants for your life. And so you prayerfully work through those things. So there's so many things that we could deal with in our life, you know, directions for our life, jobs for our life, uh, the, the things that in terms of what we, we think in material things. Uh, that we want for this, this life. And God says, I have so much more. I have so much more, much greater for you. And, and that's what the apostles were getting ready to find out. They were going to walk. They, they had, they, it was hard for them to see that they were getting ready to walk through a very dark period with him going to the cross. But on the other side was the resurrection and a transformed life where these guys were going to go out and change the world for the cause of Christ. That was coming. So, you know, who is greater was, was nothing, was nothing at this point. They were seeking self-glory, prestige, and prominence. And this was an ongoing theme. This was an ongoing theme. Um, even though Jesus in Matthew 16, remember, we, had just, we just studied this about if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me forever. For who, sh- who would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He's trying to teach them in the way, but it raged on. Matthew 20 rages on. James and John's mother We've all had, you know, there's parents, you know, that stepped in and was like, hey, can my child this? Can my child that? Well, he, they were, you know, J- James and John's mother was saying, can they sit at your right and left hand to Jesus? And then even at the, the before Jesus' crucifixion at the Passover meal, as Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it says here in Luke chapter 22, 24, it says a dispute also arose among them as to which would be regarded as the greatest. That was an ongoing all the way, all the way through. So Jesus, as he's, he answers this question, they, they, they pose this question to him as opposed to trying to call out. They were like, well, just let's let Jesus solve it. Who is the greatest? And so Jesus, verse 2 says, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and, and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so we're back to this understanding the kingdom of heaven. And so I just want to say, and for the sake of time, won't develop it, but when you see kingdom heaven, kingdom of God, it's the same. It's the same. Uh, the difference is we, we, have, we understand who the authority is in the kingdom of God. It's God himself. And the kingdom of heaven is the realm for which we live under God's rule. So just understand when you see that in the Bible, those are the same. And so the first thing I want us to to look at this morning in your notes, and there's notes back there by uh, the offering table and the communion uh, table, uh, if you want to take notes today. But we enter the kingdom of heaven like little children. Like little children, this story is not about this particular child. This is an illustration of who we are, who each of us, who, who we, are. we are. We are God's children. It's Pideon is the, is the name that the Greek word gives to a very, very young child. This is like a baby toddler. You know, and I, I got to see, see one of those last night at the wedding, just, just one, barely one years old. And man, this little guy was walking. And he actually was the ring bearer, you know, for this uh, wedding. But he's still very much a baby and on the way to that toddler realm. And it could have been, it could have been even a child younger that they brought to put, you know, that Jesus asked for that day. But I, first off, I want us to understand that we are considered people, the people of God, the God's people, those who have given their life to Christ, the most common name by which we are ever called uh, in the Bible is children of God. John 1, 
12 and 13 says, But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave us the right to become the children of God. 1 John 2, 12, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Within that reality, we, as we are his children, we are uh, little children. We're these like totally dependent children in life. A child of this age is simple. It's not complex. They don't have uh, issues to deal with. They, they just want to make sure a mom or a dad is around or a grandparent uh, or you know somebody who's there to take care of them. They're helpless. They're dependent totally on the, 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 for every aspect of their needs. And really, their needs are limited. They need sleep, they need to eat, and they need cleaned up at times. It's not, it's not rocket science. That is how dependent a little, a little one is. And as ch- God's children, we depend on the good graces of our Father in heaven. Like children, we are weak. Like children, we are dependent We are submissive, unskilled, at times ignorant, and sometimes stubborn and very vulnerable. That is the child. So believers are the children of God. So we must come, we must enter the kingdom of heaven like little children. And that understanding of enter, I want to emphasize that. I also highlighted that in in my Bible and I looked, I looked for that word. First, it's, it's related to that word turn as we enter uh, the kingdom of God. We turn or we're converted. Uh, that, that is a transformation that takes place when we accept Christ, when we just say yes to Jesus. We make a turn from the life that we think we wanted to a, a life that God has established before uh, our, our, our existence even came to be. And so it's his heart's desire that all would turn. Second Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. In other words, when's he coming? When is Jesus, when is God going to return? Instead, instead, for your cause, for my cause, for that guy I spoke to the other day who said no, God is patient. He is patient with us, not wanting, uh, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, to turn, to be converted, entering into the kingdom of heaven. It simply means to be saved. And so that's the picture. That's the mark of a child that uh, Matthew 7, 21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of God. My Father who is in heaven. So how do you how do you know you know someone is a believer? Well, they're doing they they work every day uh, in their life to follow the things that God His Word. It, it's 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 very simple to understand. Hey, I just got to follow what God says on one side. The other side is this. You know, we don't always succeed in that. We're not always perfect. We're not always, but it's, it's my desire every day as I get up to, to, to walk in the steps that God would have for my life. Matthew 19, 23, and there's a lot of scriptures. That's why if you want to take those notes, uh, even take them when you leave today. All these scriptures are noted there. It says, and Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. That, you remember the rich young ruler who just couldn't give up his life uh, to follow Christ? That was the answer. I mean, it's not impossible. It's not impossible when we're, when we're clouded by the things of this world. But if we give, lay down the things of this world for, the, for Christ to come into our life, Matthew 25, 21, he says, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Uh, These words are all uh, familiar in terms of how we enter. We enter in verse Matthew 7, 13, by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. And, and, and I think we, we don't have to, we could take a second to look at the world and everything the world is trying to offer. 
uh, the destructive things of this world, we can see there's a wide open you know, path of destruction out there. And that, that, you know, God saving our lives through Christ is what keeps us from uh, perishing internally. So who is the greatest? Uh, verse, verse 4 back in Matthew uh, chapter 18, it says, Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So they were getting ready to experience. And remember, a child... Uh, like humility, they're dependent, meek, and trustful. There's no great ambition of a little one. And they just want somebody to meet their needs. That's what we, we turn to our Heavenly Father to meet our every need. And, and our needs are more. We, we live in such the material side of life that our needs are way more than just the material. You know, we have deep needs. I was talking to a psychologist yesterday at the wedding, and he said that mental health is, is, you know, harder to deal with more now than it's ever been, and that there's great needs within the mental health world, and, and so that, that's where our Heavenly Father meets us. So we humble ourselves, and that word tapanao is the Greek word for lower yourself. We're, we're the servants, where we humble ourselves. So the, the, first, the first is we enter as children. Secondly, this morning, we receive the children of God. Once, we are, once we're in the room with the Lord, uh, each of us are children of God. We receive the children of God. It says, verse 5, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And so that's a picture and reality is that it's impossible to separate God from his people. That we are, we are bound together with God. We are bound up uh, with God as his people. And, and the picture here is, uh, is, is just how powerful that bond is. Zechariah 2.8 talks about Israel. It says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, he, he sent me a- after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he... Who, t- who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now, when we think of, you know, the apple of someone's eye, we literally, I think we move, I typically move to a bushel of apples or I'm looking at a tree full of apples and I'm looking for the best apple, right? We all want the best apple. We've had some really good apples in this life. But that's not what this particular understanding of the apple of his eye is. The apple of his eyes in a Jewish, in a Jewish mindset was this. It, it was the iris of the eye, the opening, the very tender spot in the eye. And when, G, when God is speaking through Zechariah here, he's saying, when you mess with my people, you're poking me in the eye. That's very irritating. Have you ever been poked in the eye? It's irritating, you know? And, and so for God, when you mess with his people, when you mess with his people, I've shared this story before, but when my brother, my twin brother and I were little, probably about eight, eight or nine years of age, we, you know, because of being a twin, we were slow growers. You know, we were just tiny little scrawny guys. And there were a couple big guys, you know, that were in our neighborhood, and we were walking on 23rd Street back to our house one day, and those two big guys, to us, they just like, looked like giants, but they were the same age, and they picked on us. They stopped us in the, on the sidewalk. We tried to avoid them because we knew they were trouble. They bullied us, and it's, you know, when you get bullied, you, people understand when you get bullied, it, it, you, don't, you don't walk away feeling good about it. And so we're at home that afternoon, and Dad was working days that day and came home, and he could see my twin brother Mike and I, you know, moping around, and he was like, what is going on with you guys? And, and, and we're like, nothing, it's nothing, no, something, you guys, you know, the hyper twins, you guys, there's something wrong. And so, and he, he finally got it out of us that this, these guys bullied us. Well, who is it? Who bullied you? And we told him, and the next thing, he, he's like, get in the car. Get in the car. So we drive, we're driving. He knows where these guys live. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy. We're going to their house. 
And so I'm like, that's right, my dad, my dad's going to take care of business. So you get, then you get that feeling inside you like, dad is going to take care of business. These guys, he's going to beat up on two kids, you know. As a kid, you don't care. You don't even think that's wrong. He's saying, my dad is going to take care of business. So we pull up to the, the house. He says, get out of the car. We're like, what? Get out of the car. Okay, get out of the car. Now go up, knock on that door. Are you, what are you doing? I'm staying in the car. Go up there and knock on that door. So we go knock on the door. This dad comes to the door, and, and we are standing there and saying, is so-and-so here? You know, and the, you know, it's like, you know, the, he was bullying us. Oh, is that a fright that he was bullying you guys? All right, hold him in. You know, hey, you know, and so he comes in to the door, and, you know, we're just standing there, you know. <laughs> we're just looking up, looking up at him like, well, what do we do now? And my dad yells from the car, do you want to fight my boys? And we're like, in our side, we're like, what did he just say? <laughs> That's not how I thought this was going down. And he was like, no, sir, I don't want to fight your boys, because if you want to fight my boys, you can take them one at a time. It doesn't matter to me right here in the front yard of your house. No, sir, then you apologize to him, and I don't want you ever bullying my boys again. Okay, I'm sorry, you know, and then, then we get in the car, and we drive off, and we're like, yes, <laughs> yes. That, that is how, that's a God we serve and how he takes care of us. He takes care of us. Matthew 10, 40 says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. God takes care of us. Luke 10, 16 says, He who hears, hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me uh, rejects him who sent me. We are bound up with God for life. So that's why we we receive the children of God, those who are also bound up with God, who come in to the family. The third thing that we look at this morning is in verses 6 and 7, as we protect the children of God. Just like we saw, you know, in, in my dad trying to protect us as a parent, our father protects us, and we're to protect the children of God. Verse 6 and 7, very convicting, very convicting, this this. Part of the, the scripture uh, is probably the, one of the hardest things to live by in each of our lives. It says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it, uh, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world. He, he moves from now like the believers in verse 6. Now he's talking about the world in verse 7. He says, Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptations come. So let's break that down first to recognize uh, as we protect children is that we shouldn't cause the, little, the children of God to sin. Our example, that's the picture that Jesus is painting here. That when we have sin in our life, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, then it can lead to cause the, the, the little ones, the, the other children. And again, remember, we're talking about God's family, God's people. We're not talking about a little baby toddler. That was the example. We're the children of God. And as we come into the, as children of God, we spend a lifetime. We're growing Paul teaches, or Peter teaches us that in his epistles, that we're growing and that the food gets better. We dig deeper into his word in each of our lives. We grow, but we're always dependent and needy children. And so we're not to cause the children of God to sin. And here they're debating who is the greatest that's what gets all this started. Who's the greatest? And they're causing one another to sin. Bitterness, rivalry, ambition, selfish ambition, pride, envy, jealousy, self-seeking. Those are all wrapped up in what they're seeking for their life. And so they're causing one another to sin. And so he says you'd be better off dead than alive. 
That's how deep this picture is. And the millstones, there were different levels of millstones. I got to see one of these millstones when I was in Israel in 19, or 2019. Uh, and, and this was a huge one. What he's talking about here, this mulas or mulinas, when they heard that phrase for a millstone, the Greek word mulas or mulinas, it's a mule stone. It's a stone so heavy that they had to attach it to a mule to drive it around. That's what Samson was attached to, he, to drive it around when he was grinding grain and when he was blind. And the reality is, and, and Jews did not use drowning as a form of, pers- of you know, execution, but the Romans did. And the picture here is that you would go out in the deepest part of the sea and you would hang that around one's neck and throw him into the sea and you're not coming back from that. It's a very dramatic teaching. It's a picture. And I came across a story this week of a little boy. It says this, a little boy uh, who snuck out of the house one night in the midst of the, the snow in the dead of the winter. And his father was going to the bar. And he was an alcoholic, his dad was, and he was just taking one step after another to get to this bar. And he heard something behind him, and then he turned and he noticed his little five-year-old boy was hopping from one of his footprints he had left to the other that he had left in the snow. And he stopped and he said, where are you going? And the little boy answered, I'm just following your footsteps, daddy. And the story ends with the the fact that that man picked his son up and took him back home and never took a drink again. Somebody is following in your footsteps in this life. It could be just one or it could be many. But if you have just one, an example, that isn't as it should be. And I've been there. I've not always been the, 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 the example of what God would be for my boys, for my wife, for my family, then we're leading them down a path that is not safe. It's not uh, covered. And that's part of our journey as as people of God is to be a covering for the the people to, to protect the children of God. And then he goes on to say um, that we, woe to the, the man uh, by whom the offense has come. It's the world. The world comes at us. The world comes after us. And, and we are impacted by the world. Not just in say, you know, I, you know, I followed you know, someone and I did something wrong. I mean, we could say that the, we were tempted in the world, you know, in life. And I got all kinds of stories about that. that. That's really easy to understand for every one of us. The world comes after us and it it can affect us, but also it can hurt us. People do things in life that can hurt us. And what, what Jesus is saying here is, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Understand this, understand this, on the side of that reality that God will deal in this life or in the life to come, he will deal with that, you know, offense from people in our lives. But the other side of this is this. That the way we protect our, the children of God, this family, our kids, our families in this life is that we should deal dramatically with the sin in our own lives. And it's personal. That's one of the things that Jesus is reaching out. He uses this term in verses 8 and 9. Uh, these cha- let's look at verses 8 and 9, chapter 18. It says, If your hand uh, or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal life. Or if your eye caused you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two to be thrown into the hellfire. Now, we've already looked at this. We're specifically speaking here about the children of God and, our, and dealing with our sinfulness. In Matthew 5, um, Jesus is in a more public venue, remember, on the Sermon on the Mount. He's out publicly, and there's all kinds of people. There are people who are following him. There are, there are people who are not believers yet. And, and so he used this same illustration. 
And understand it's a hyperbole. It's, it's not like he's expecting you to go cut off your hand or poke out your eye. Because you could cut off this hand and, you know, and you'd still have this hand. Or, you, you know, you could poke out one eye, you'd still have the other eye. But if you take them all, you still have your mind and your heart. That's the mindset here. It goes deep down into our minds and our hearts. It's in our minds and hearts that, that sin is conceived and given birth through the actions of our lives. That's the picture here. So it's more, it's more than, than dealing with, you know, just the actual, you know, trying to be an outward example. It starts in the heart, and so we should deal dramatically with sin in our own lives. That's the picture so we move from that, that to the final point that we want to look at today. And there's a couple of things in here that I think are special to look at. So the, first, the point is this. We care for the children of God. Uh, we care for the children of God. And verse 10 says this. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. So a couple things we want to look at. First is not to despise. The word phroneo uh, means has to do and uh, the word kata. So kata phroneo in the Greek is to, is, is to look down. So the mind to look down on someone. That's, that's what it literally means when it, and simply for you and I is we shouldn't look down on anybody. Now I don't know about you, but there may just be maybe one person in my whole life that I've ever looked down on, right? No? Man, we probably looked down on some people this week. Don't raise your hand. Hey, did you look at, you just looked at somebody and you thought, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, have mercy. And we need that mercy because he, we need that mercy. This is big. This is a big one. This is a convicting one. You know, if we're, if we're to deal dramatically with the sin in our life and understand how, you know, uh, we impact, our influence impacts, this is the next thing. It's like, how do we look upon the children of God around us? There, there are people that we struggle with at times, but we're not to look down. We're not to despise them. Don't look down on people. Don't put yourself up and look down as if they were below you. They're not valueless. They're not useless. They're not worthless. We shouldn't hold them in contempt. See, the world despises the simple. We just, they, the world despises the humble, despises the meek. But it exalts those who are great, the superstars, the heroes. That's not how we're to be. God in heaven cares for the little ones. That's the picture here. The littlest, the least of these, and he cares for them equally. So when we care for the children of God, we don't look down on others. And why is that? Why is that? Well, the picture here is because that's the heart of God. We care for one another as his, as his children because that is the heart of God. How do we know that is the heart of God. Well, we see it here in the second part of verse 10. It says, so again, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels, their angels. And I want you to look at that. I want you to highlight that, that word there. Their angels are always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And so they are, they, there are angels. Now, it's bigger. I, I want to just want to say this. And um, as you study angels, in, in the Bible, there's not a guardian angel for everyone. Now, we grew up, you probably grew up talking about guardian angels. That was a Jewish custom, a tradition, that they believed that there is a guardian angel for each person on this planet. But the reality, it's much more than this concept that we have as a guardian angel. It's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. I looked, I scoured, I researched, I looked, you know, for this understanding that re the reality is God, these angels, and we don't know how many of them, legions perhaps, their responsibility is to care for the people of God. 
And the Bible speaks to angels. We see in Hebrews 1, 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit uh, salvation? So angels are at work. I, I'm a believer. I'm a believer, and it's bigger than just guardian angels. Now, my mom, Jeff, and my mom, I'm, years ago, she passed away this past summer. But probably when she was about 60 years of age, I was in Vincennes. I get a call, and my twin brother Mike was calling. It was a, we had just come back from a, a retreat. We were pulling into the church that morning, that Sunday morning, from a re, youth retreat at Camp Ileana. And my mom had fallen. She had, was getting her oil changed in Columbus, Ohio. And they brought her out to look at an air filter on her car to see if she needed a new one, if she wanted a new one. And then, and then they, they let her go back to the office by herself. And when she turned, she fell directly into an oil pit. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked down one of those oil pits, but it was a pretty traumatic event. And all I can say is my mom, when she fell, she went head first. She hit her head on a, the giant toolbox that they have that rolls around in there and then down into the pit. And she had minimal injuries. She was in the hospital. Jeff and I drove to Columbus, Ohio. And all we could say when we saw her was she was sitting up in bed. It's like there were some angels squished when you flow down into that, into that pit. I just had to believe because mo most people probably would have perished. It didn't make sense. Now, can I, can I say that were, they were angels? Well, it could, I mean, God, it says here, they use, he, he sends his angels. And there's probably been angels that have ministered to you in your life that you weren't even aware of. But I say this to say that God, Jesus puts this here for a reason. That if God, is his heart is to care for his children, and so much so that he uses his legions of angels to care for us as well, then as his church, who the angels look to, look up to, we as a church should be caring for one another. Amen? We should care for one another. And it goes on to the final part of this, this understanding of caring for the child is that we pursue one another if we wander away. Uh, let's let's look, at, look, look at that here in verses 12 through 14. It says, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? Does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly uh, to you, he rejoices. I say to you, he rejoices more of that one sheep than, uh, than, than over, or rejoices for more over that one, that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of the least of these should perish. There's that phrase again we, we read from Peter. Now we're seeing it here from Jesus himself. And here we find God is like a shepherd. And one of the, one of the sheep, one of the, one of the believers... We've seen this in our life. If you've lived long enough, you've seen people, that godly good people who have migrated away. And as a church, we're to reach out to them. We're going to see this uh, play out at the end of this chapter and how we approach people and how we deal with conflict in our lives. But the concern is that when, when someone leaves, leaves the, the, you know, the, the protection, that leaves the... the the, the fold, the sheepfold, out into the world that they can be devastated, that the sin of their life, the sin that they're you know, experiencing can devastate them. And so it is, it is God's desire. We got this picture of the, of the shepherd who goes after the sheep, and that's part of the care of the sheep. We care for each other like children to the point to the degree that we pursue each other back from danger. 
And as a dad growing up, I always did Robbie the Robot, Danger, Will Robinson. I was always doing that in front of the boys. And they were looking at me like, what are you doing? You know? It's like, because they wanted to go do something that, you know, that was not safe. I'm like, whoa, Danger, Will Robinson, Danger. They never even saw that movie or saw the show. But the picture here is that we go pursue, that we go and try to bring back. And that's a tender thing. Because when we're outside of the fold, sometimes we're not interested in, in coming back in that moment. But it's a prayerful thing. And I want us to notice a couple of things. One, it's, it's for individual care. We're going out after the individual. That is what we see in this passage. It's heartfelt care. We care deep in our heart. We're, we're ate up with it. We, we can't live with it. And I say this all the time, and, and it's, it's part of our lives. But you got to want it more than I do, but I'm telling you, I want it for you. And it's hard when you want it more than somebody wants it for themselves. But that's part of our journey as, as his children coming into our each up one another's life and saying, listen, I'm here. It's hard to be there. But it's individual, it's heartfelt, and it's forgiving. The care that we are to come out with is forgiving. That's the picture. Because this sheep has gone astray. But the shepherd goes out, and when he finds it, he rejoices to carry it back to the fold. And it's about restoration and recovery, and that's possible. That's possible. It's just a step back. My pastor David Easter always said that you could be 10,000 steps away from God and it's just one step back. Just make one turn and step back. And it's amazing. James 5 says this, 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back a sinner from his wondering uh, will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. There's a lot to be ta- ta- spoke of. But that's, that's the picture here. And we all, could, we, we all need that tender care in our life at some point. We're speaking here in this, in this today about the heart of God for His children. And He loves His children. He loves His cheer, children dearly so much so that He sent His Son to die. And that's the picture that Jesus is painting now as He gets ready to come to the cross. He's preparing his disciples, for him being, getting ready to be gone, for him to go through the cross, and for their, for their eventual mission into the life after Christ returns to heaven of what God is going to do in their life. So let's be faithful uh, as children of God to the children of God. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given us a lot to say, so much more, way much more that could be said. But Lord, it's a, it's a picture of, of how we're to, to love one another and to, to um, be engaged. Lord, help us be engaged in, in the lives of people. Because uh, that takes time, it takes sacrifice, it, it takes effort. But that's okay. Because that's what you've called us to. Thank you for this example you set before us in, this, uh, this, in your word this morning. Lord, help us to be the church that you've called each of us to be, your children that you've called us to be uh, in this body as well as, Father, in the world, uh, the worldwide church and and in our families, to be the godly example you've called us to be and and protect us and help us deal radically with the sin in each of our lives and to step towards you to make that turn, to stay in the fold to experience the direction and the life that you would have us to, to, to have, that life that's going to bring us to people that you will use our lives and our, us, that you will work through us to impact. You will use us, Lord, to help uh, bring them into the fold, for them to enter in and to be converted. So, Lord, help us to be faithful to that calling you have on each of our lives, each of our lives. Lord, bless this time now as we come um, to this time of, of your table. I pray for those who are watching 
uh, online or those who are here right in person, that we would first and foremost, those, those who need to deal with the sin in their life, that they'll deal with that right now. They'll come to you uh, and just confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So deal with that sin in your life today. Make that step towards the Lord. But for those maybe who, who would say, I've not entered in, then just pray a prayer to enter in. Pray something like this. Dear Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus, who lived and he gave his life for me. And he rose again. I ask him to come into my heart. Forgive my sins. And from this day, I choose to follow him. I bless your body that was broken for us in communion this morning and your blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sin. We love you, and we thank you that you love us so deeply in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.